Welcome to Dare to Leap, a conversation and community supporting women just like you to gain the freedom, flexibility, and financial security you desire and deserve with CEO and founder of Virtual Expert Training, Kathy Guggenauer. This is Dare to Leap, and now here's the powerhouse tiara-wearing Kathy Guggenauer. Welcome once again to Dare to Leap podcast. It's your tiara wearing leader here, Kathy Guggenauer. And today I have the pleasure of introducing you to Mark James. You guys, this is my first male, my first guy to interview on a podcast. And he even knows it and was willing to do it. Can you guys believe that? I just want to tell you a little bit about Mark before we let him do any talking. So Mark, it has just blown me away. We had the privilege of talking about a month ago and I immediately was like, I have to interview on you on my podcast. Mark is, has many, many things that he does. He is actually a certified CMO, chief marketing officer Council in Marketing Performance Measurement. And I will tell you that that alone, just saying that scares me because I know that means numbers. <laughs> I know they are important to my business. I'm still getting my brain around actually uh, welcoming them into my business. And he uses that to help companies evaluate their marketing efforts and reliably measure the results. And that's why, yes, I am getting my brain around these kind of numbers. He is also an accomplished, and I apologize, bark, dog decides to bark, of course, the minute I start this, so just try to tune him out. I could stop, but guess what? He would just bark again. So Mark is an accomplished business advisor with over 40 years business improvement experience. And don't we all love the idea of having our businesses improved? He is the founder and president of Performance Advisors Group Incorporated, where he specializes in workplace and channel performance, change management, and customer loyalty solutions. He specifically helps B2B companies eliminate barriers standing in the way of growth and, so important, competitive advantage. So, Mark, welcome. Thank you so much for being here today. Well, thank you very much, Kathy. And I, I have to say I'm honored to be your first male uh, participant. In fact, uh, I, I would say I can be your male diversity officer uh, <laughs> in terms of a representation. You're happy to do that. But, no, I'm, I'm honored to be here. M Let's put an acronym to that. M male, M-D-O, M-D-O. M I'll be your M-D-O. <laughs> Happy to do oh it. Oh my gosh. Happy thank you. It. Thank you so much. I appreciate well, and, it. And thank you for that that introduction. Uh, you you uh, you had even me impressed. I, I'm going like, wow, <laughs> I do all that stuff? <laughs> yeah. And I didn't even mention that you also have a finance degree and an MBA. Could Are you an overachiever, Mark? Uh <laughs> Not like my daughters, but uh, I hopefully where I've needed to achieve in life, I've done it. I know that I had great parents and a great upbringing, classic Midwestern values. So I think those have served me well. So to the extent that achievement is uh, is important in life, I'm a big a believer in that. And I certainly am a believer in an in a abundance mindset, uh, especially in the world. Uh, and, and when you run a business, uh, having an abundance mindset is per perhaps the first place where you can establish a differentiation versus a lot of your competition. So I try to embrace those kinds of things in terms of how I, how I approach business and life in general. Um, so well, Mark, I have a list of questions to ask you, but I can't go on to them yet because you just hit on a topic that I love the abundance mindset. So could you yeah. talk a little bit more about that for people who really, I, I find that there are a lot of people who don't quite grasp, what that really means and how it can be beneficial to your business. Yeah, it's uh, the concept is it's relatively simple or, or let me put it this way. Uh, there's no need to overcomplicate it and, and make it a, a big psychological study or, or try to put you know, too many, too much complication in, into what it really means. An abundance mindset basically says that um, you always look for opportunities in everything you're presented with. 
and, and, and even and especially in times of crisis that, that we've all unfortunately had to endure in the last, over the last several months, there are always opportunities that exist. And so the, the, the abundance mindset says that I'm going to look for opportunities rather than trying to stay in a fear and frustration and overwhelmed state of mind. So think, think of abundance mindset as the opposite of being fearful or being frustrated or feeling overwhelmed. That's the way I would describe uh, the definition. I love that. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that. I know it wasn't one of the things that we talked about, but That's wow, that is just something that I love. Uh, you know, um, just to tell you something personal about me, um, you know, I, I've been building a business since 2001 and I've built several different businesses since then. And I would get stuck at a particular um, level of revenue and I would stay stuck there for a very long mm -hmm. period of time. And I was doing everything that my coaches and all the experts told me to do. And still I stayed stuck at that. And then I did some mindset work, worked on that abundance mindset rather than a scarcity mindset. And boom, my business tripled in one year and then uh, doubled the next year. And literally that was the only thing I did different. Uh, Does that surprise point. you? Uh, no, it doesn't surprise me. And in fact, uh, it, it, it speaks to a, a, an important critical success factor in, in terms of an abundance mindset. It's hard to have an abundance mindset if you don't have goals. So mm. having goals and, and, and goals that are, they need to be realistic, certainly, but uh, goals mm -hmm. are also designed to take you out of your comfort zone, which all of us, it, it's human nature to remain in comfort zones. In fact, the work I do in change management is all about uh, helping organizations and people face with change to overcome the resistance to change because that's the number one barrier to successful change, especially in organizations, is the fear of resistance to want to change. So um, part, of how you, how, part of how you address that personally and, and also within organizations is have goals and have goals in mind that, that, that force you to be a little uncomfortable, to take you out of your comfort zone. But it's okay yeah. because uh, if, if you if your if your goals and your your direction and your vision are right, where you want to be, and and you know that to get there you're going to have to rely on people and things around you, and you treat others as you want to be treated yourself, um, it's not that scary, because people people will want to help you. People, uh, we all I think love to be around other people who are successful and have that mindset as opposed to being around somebody who's constantly in a downer frame of mind. I mean, if we had the choice, where would we rather spend our time? So when you, when you yourself have an abundance mindset and positive looking forward and are stretching and, and taking yourself out of your comfort zone, you're going to find a support system that you'd be amazed exists. Yeah. Oh, you are, you are so right about that. And one of my favorite quotes, I literally have it framed and I carry it in my car. I know that might sound weird that I have a framed quote in my car, but uh -huh. I, in my car is where I used to start getting those fears of, oh my gosh, what am I doing? What have I gotten into? So that's why yeah. I started carrying it. Um, and it is, if your dreams don't scare you, they aren't big enough. Oh, well said. Yeah. They're not mm -hmm. big enough. Exactly. Now that's well mm -hmm. said. I have, to, mm -hmm. I have to remember that one myself. I'm always looking for new quotes. I, I have developed a bit of a reputation for being quote boy. So if I throw some out here during this conversation. Oh, please no. do. <laughs> But I, yeah, you can tell I love them. No, yeah. they, they, well, they, they help they help put context in, in our lives and what we do. Mm -hmm. so, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for that. Yeah. So now let's take a step back. And I would love for you to tell us a little bit so that we understand who you are and where you are about your business and where you're physically located and anything like that you want to share about your business sure. and yourself. Sure be happy to uh, I'll do it very quickly because uh, oh, I'm sure you have some other questions you want to ask. But yeah, my, my business is all about helping uh, B2B organizations get rid of those barriers that get in the way of growth and competitive advantage and also find those hidden opportunities that exist in any organization uh, and, and with how that organization goes to market. And, and that, and that um, quite often comes down to helping with the performance of people, employees, distribution channel partners, and even people upstream in a, in, in a, a value chain distribution situation. And then also helping to uh, find opportunities to improve the processes that people use to get their job done. 
uh, a lot of the performance issues that exist in organizations typically are in those two areas. And, and two of my favorite statistics that I, I, I quote, Human Capital League has done research uh, and they have found that in a typical organization, less only 42% of the people in that organization, the employees even know what the, the company's values, mission and vision are. And if you understand, or if we accept that values, mission and vision are sort of the voice of the business of the customer, think about how difficult it is if over half of your employees don't even know what those are in terms of delivering that that experience, that expected experience that that voice is telling the customer. Related to that, uh, on, on, the, on the process of the operational side of a business, uh, you can have very engaged and enthusiastic people. They know what they're doing. They get the values, mission, and vision. But if they're, if they're slaving under really bad processes, that's going to impact uh, performance as well for the organization and the customer experience, and then hence growth and, and competitive advantage in terms of being able to sustain those things. Couple of statistics, statistics as it relates to that. Um, in a typical organization, the conference board has found that um, nearly two thirds of employees are only one third as productive as they could be simply because they don't understand what they're being asked to do. Uh, the implication there is that there is a huge communication challenge. And employees are always asking five questions. Uh, and, and those five questions relate to having the right answers for their behavior. What is it you want me to do? How should I do it? How am I doing at it? What's in it for me or why should I do it? And then lastly, where am I going? What's my future here? And it's up to leadership in an organization to clearly in a real unambiguous way answer those questions so that employees can understand answers to those because those are the things that, that impact their behavior directly. In fact, the processes, if, if they're encumbered by processes that are, that are, um, over, overly burdensome, um, then they're, they're not going to be successful, even if they have the answer to those questions. Second statistic as it relates to that, in a typical organization, 50 to 75% of the activities that the employees perform add zero value to the outcome. So imagine what can happen to your productivity and the customer experience and growth and advantage if you can eliminate those, those things that, that add no value. And what are the things that, that, that create those, those, those non-value act activities? Um, it could, it, 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 a lot of it has to do with redundancy, a lot of redundant steps that just could have creeped into the way the business has operated over the years. Um, it could be politics or silos that have developed, competing interests, uh, lack of direction or confusion. Uh, for instance, if people aren't grounded in the values of the organization and they're not clear in the mission, then activities can creep in because people will make it up as they go. And that's just human nature. So if you're not providing good direction as a leader or an owner of a business, um, you create a situation where your processes can kind of get gummed up, so to speak. So that, that, those are the areas I work with uh, in a business to help in that arena. And then related to that, I also help with change management, helping through the process of change. And change is uh, something that most organizations struggle with, manufacturers, a provider of services in the B2B world, they're really good at what they do. They make a great widget, they provide a great service. But when it comes to the managing the, the process of change, and change is really more of a journey. It's not a process per se. It's not an event. Um, you, have to, you have to manage change properly. And a lot of, as I said before, it has to do with overcoming resistance to change, making sure you have people uh, aligned and, and on board for the journey. Uh, that you've got a, a specific plan because change won't happen, at least desired change won't happen on its own. You have to actively manage it and you have to communicate uh, like, like crazy with your various audiences, with employees, especially during a process of change brought on by a merger or an acquisition or a restructuring. You need to especially be in touch with your customers because they're going to be, they're going to be concerned and nervous about what's going on uh, because of these things that I'm seeing with this company that's providing me services or products. Um, and also understand that uh, more than ever, you should be in touch with your customers during the process of change because the competition out there makes no blood in the water and uh, uh, it, it raises the possibility of more competitive temptation on your customers. So those are the two areas. The third area then final area is uh, what I call precision marketing, helping organizations use good data and little analytics about their customers, the customer's interaction with your products and services and the marketplace to get, to get the right message to the right customer at the right time at the lowest possible cost. 
Uh, and that's where my certification by the chief marketing officer council comes into play. And I should just make one clarification there. I'm not a CMO per se. I am certified by the CMO council in their model and framework for marketing performance measurement. So I use that to help organizations vet their marketing efforts or their plans. And then more importantly, they help them uh, measure uh, and have reliable results uh, to prove up that their investment and their marketing is in the right places and is getting in the return they're looking for. So that's my story. I'm sticking to it. I won't go any further. That's probably enough for your audience. <laughs> Mark, that was amazing. I'm going to tell you right now, In that was probably five minutes at the most, and I just learned so much, <laughs> and I could talk to you all day long about each and every one of those things, and I do want to circle back and ask you sure. a couple of things. Um, one is when you said um, the percentage of people that do not know the company's values mission and vision and that you yeah. really really need to communicate that and i know this could probably take a really long time to answer but any quick tip that you could give any best practice or anything like that you could give on how to even begin to communicate that in a way that people really get it because i will tell you i am struggling with that myself yeah it, it is a. Uh... It's a communication issue primarily, um, and the responsibility for communicating those things lies with the ownership or leadership of an organization. That's where the responsibility begins, and so it's the, it's a responsibility of leaders and owners to make sure that clearly that there are there is a set of core values that are defined, and there's a mission defined that are based on those core values, and then there's a vision. And by the way. A mission and vision should be should be developed only after you've developed your core values. And your core values as an organization are simply, I, I, I refer to your core values as your DNA. It describes what you stand for, what you believe in, what's not negotiable in terms of how we do our business and what we're going to do to help our customers. And once you've got a lock and you've got a baseline of, of, of good core values, no more than four to six, and be careful about using platitudes and, and, and corporate buzzwords. It's got to be genuine and believable stuff. Then you develop your mission statement. Then you develop your vision statement. So that's the baseline. And that's the first thing that leadership needs to do. And it, it it's, of course, makes sense to involve the employees in the organization in, in, uh, in tweaking those or defining them if they don't exist now. But it, it really becomes down to a communication issue. And it is, it's, a, it's a combination of making sure that those things are clear and unambiguous and they're constantly communicated and constantly re reinforced. One of the things I talk about when I do uh, some workshops for clients, um, I talk about there are two allies you have uh, as a leader or, a, or a, an owner in a business. Your two allies are, allies are what I call two undeniable truths of human behavior. First of all, what gets talked about in this world is what gets done. And also in this world, what gets measured is what gets done. So the more you talk about your, your mission, your values and your, your vision, the more people are going to incorporate them and think about them. What, like, as they say, what gets talked about is what gets done. So it's not a matter of putting them out there and checking the box and saying, okay, now we we put them out there and assuming everybody knows what they are and understands them as living them every day. It's a never ending process. It's sort of a passion of mine right now. I've, I've seen so many organizations where they regard their values, mission, and vision as, well, we kind of kind of had those things. And, all right, we check the box and we've got them, we publish them and we have great flowing words. But there's no effort made to, to reinforce those with the employees, with distribution channel partners and with customers. So it's a never ending thing. And, and if you're going to live them, you have to live them, which means you have to communicate them and you have to keep talking about them. Does that answer I the question? I love that. Yeah. Yes, that, that really makes sense to me. And I'm taking that to heart, I will tell you, because... Um, I can see how repeating them over and over again, making them very clear, understandable, all of that. And I know exactly how to do that now that you've said that. It's so interesting because often I think, oh, I'm not going to know how to do whatever it is he says to do. <laughs> He's just going to be complicated. And then when you said that, I'm like, oh, I know how to do that. Yeah, I just didn't realize it. that's what I needed to do. Yeah, think about it in this term, in these terms. Uh, when it comes to those things, uh, practice what I call the 13X rule. Whatever, whatever your current cadence now in, in, in an organization with how you're communicating to people about what you expect of them, how you're answering those five questions, what should I do, how should I do it, and so on, and values, mission, and vision especially, if you're communicating at X now, you should take that, that cadence and that frequency up by 13-fold. 
because uh, it goes back to that old notion in the old days when I was a, when I was a kid growing up and in college, I, I was told that in order for people to remember, remember something, they have to hear it eight times. Yes. In today's world, and I, and I don't, I don't have psychological research to back this up other than just anecdotally, anecdotally, mm-hmm. it's more like 13 times now because there's, because we're all so bombarded with information and stimulus out there in the world every day that you really have to take it up beyond the eightfold, the 13 fold at least. I totally agree with you. Um, my background is also in marketing and, yeah. um, you know, I often have said that exact thing, you know, you have to touch somebody at least eight times. Yeah. And then, and now if I say it accidentally, cause it's been in my brain for so long, somebody goes, yeah, it's a lot more than that. Now I'm like, Oh yeah, you're right. It is. Yeah. So tell us where you are physically and is oh, sure. this your office? Tell us about this. It yeah. Awesome. I, uh, yeah. I, well, this is the world headquarters right here. As you see behind me, um, <laughs> I, I, uh, very I live, nice. <laughs> well, it's, uh, uh, I, I'm my old interior decorator. So I, you know, uh, I don't claim to be an expert, but it works, <laughs> it works for me. <laughs> uh, it looks live, good. It does. Well, thank you. Thank you. I live and work in uh, Yorkville, Illinois, which is a far western suburb of Chicago. We're about 50 miles west of downtown Chicago, west a little southwest uh, of Chicago. I grew up in a small farming community just west of here called Samanac, Illinois. Every chance I get, I try to put the name on the map because nobody even can barely pronounce the (laughs) word, much less less know what it is. So a little small farming community of Samanac, Illinois. I was... uh, Born and raised, born and raised there. When I was born, uh, and it was it was a long time ago, certainly after Lincoln was shot. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Although I, I was I was born I was born uh, right about the time that Eisenhower became president. Uh, so I'll let you figure out the years. But at that time, <laughs> Samanac was 700 uh, people in the town, and my parents were the first people in town to have a private telephone line when I was probably about five or six years old, uh, my dad who had grown up on the South side of Chicago couldn't stand the notion of, of everybody listening in on a party line, you know, the Mrs. Mm-hmm. Kravitz listening, so to speak. Mm-hmm. So he, he was insistent as soon as the general telephone company in that area offered private telephone lines. I think my dad and mom were the first people in town to have a private telephone line. So the bottom line, I'm, I'm being long-winded here, but I, you know, I grew up classic Midwestern value, small town. My parents were business owners. They owned, an, owned and operated a jewelry store for, for 54 years before they ultimately passed on. And uh, everybody in this world should at one time or another have a retail job because the wheels of commerce don't begin to turn pretty much until somebody buys something at retail or in the B2B world, B2B world is supplying stuff that ultimately goes into that retail world. So uh, everybody should have a retail job of at least one in their lives. I've had several, uh, and uh, I learned a lot from working in my parents' business and was taught a lot of things. So um, that's that's where I live now, Yorkville, Illinois. The world headquarters is right here in the house. I don't. I run pretty <laughs> lean because of my outsourced resource model. I don't need to have an office. I don't want an office. I don't need to have that expense. Uh, and if I'm on the street, I, I'm going to be at a client's place of business. That's where I should be when I'm not in the office. So. Well, you have just uh, said exactly where I wanted to head. Tell us about your outsource resource model. Sure. Uh, I, uh, my career includes uh, a lot of corporate stops in the corporate world. I was in the oil business for nine and a half years out of, out of college uh, in sales and marketing positions. Uh, I was also in the securities industry. Uh, and then I was in the incentive and motivation business. And that's part of what I do this today. I I can architect incentive programs for clients to uh, in, improve the behavior of salespeople or safety or uh, productivity uh, or improve the loyalty of customers, which is where that customer loyalty piece comes into play. Um, but my, I, I developed, based upon my observations working in the corporate world, I developed the notion that when I started my own business, um, I had had created a really large group of people. I call them my consortium partners. And these are people that are really good at what they do. And as uh, one of my colleagues would say, we can trust each other with our livelihoods. So when I started the business, I decided I don't, I don't need to have a lot of people on the payroll. What I, what I want to do is I want to take these people where, where, where they, have, they have ability and when there's trust between us. Those are the two criteria. 
And I'm going to build a business around the model where I'm going to call on them because I know they're really good at what they do. They're people in organization development, learning and training uh, capabilities, data and analytics, uh, marketing uh, things in terms of social media or, or other, other mediums. Uh, all, all sorts of all sorts of people with those kinds of backgrounds, and I'll bring in exactly who I need for a given client situation, no more no less. So my differentiator, because of that, is I'm able to save anywhere from 15 to 75 percent uh, overhead costs versus a lot of my large competitors, the big consulting That's firms. That's huge. In the world. That's a it big is. percentage. It is, and it doesn't mean to say that what those organizations do isn't good. They do good work, but. Um, their, their business model has a lot of people sitting around to be deployed and every customer is going to pay that overhead, whether they're using it or not or not. So with my business model and the outsource resource model, as long as I've got people where there's trust between us and, we, and they've got that resident ability, I'm going to bring and plug in people exactly what I need for a client's need, no more, no less. And that's how I eliminate the, the, uh, the overhead. So, so that's, that's how I run the business. And cert certainly virtual assistance, which is your world, is a part, yeah. is part and parcel of that. And you've got some really classy, great people that, that uh, you know, I can, I can tap into as part, of, as part of my consortium partnership. Yeah, and that's how Mark and I actually uh, met the first time is he was uh, wanting to, what did you call it? Make your bench deeper? Say that? Oh, you yeah. Used? With, with, with this business model, I'm always looking, I'm always looking for bench strength uh, because you know, people can move on and uh, there, there's, there's always somebody else that'll come along, even in something like organizational development, learning and training, who, who they'll have a different approach or a slightly different philosophy or attitude about it, where it might be a, actually a really good fit. So I'm always looking for bench strength to add. And the bench strength doesn't stop with just the stuff that I do and I provide. But I also uh, like to have bench strength with people and their capabilities for things that I don't do. So when I'm in front of a client, how I can also add value to a client when a client is looking for, you know, they, they, they need a fractional CFO to run their business because their current CFO went away. I don't do that kind of work, even though I have a finance degree. But I have people I can tap into and call and say, hey, I've got an organization here that could use your fractional CFO capabilities and I'll make the introduction. So that's part of my bench strength as well is just really to, to really be a resource resource for my clients, whether it's whether it directly relates to what I do or it doesn't. Yeah, I love well, you know, I love that model because that yeah. is also the business model, how I run my business. Yes. Um, and really how I train the virtual experts uh, to run their businesses and be able to work for people like me and you. And so it just thrilled me to death when I talked with you and found out you don't have any actual employees, right? I, uh, I have a couple of people that will come in and out if, as, on a part-time basis, but for the most part, it's a, it's a hundred percent outsource resource model for all those, all those reasons that I cited. Um, and it eliminates a lot of stuff that I don't have to worry about. I can manage the business as it relates to clients, as opposed to mm -hmm. having to manage the business from the, the standpoint of employees and so on. Mm -hmm. And the and the relationship is very important, and, and that trust element is is key. We need to be able to trust each other with our livelihoods. And for me, from my standpoint, a lot of the all, nearly all the people that I use at one time or another, whether they're virtual assistants or they're uh, you know people with organization development backgrounds or whatever. Um, quite often I'm putting them in front of my client. So my brand and my reputation's on the line. So they're representing mm -hmm. me and the assets of my organization and my image and my, my reputation. So I want to make sure mm -hmm. that uh, they're going to represent those things faithfully and mm -hmm. they're going to be, they're going to take an, a professional approach like I do because at the end of the day, it all reflects on me. So I'm very, I'm very selective and careful, but there are just some really cool people out there that really are smart at what they do. And they, they have they have the ability and they've earned the, the, the trust factor. So yeah. That that's how I So I just wanna I just wanna talk for just a minute and I know most people are gonna know this, but every once in a while I run into this question when people are like, Well, they don't really think about the difference between an employee and what we're talking about, which is like a ten ninety nine independent uh, contractor. Yeah. So an employee, that's a W two, right? And a Correct. 1099, that's a W9. Correct. Correct. That's kind of how I try to 
tell people matter of factly. And then of course there's all kinds of nuances that go in there also, but that's kind of just the bottom line to me. Any other way you like to describe the differences there? No, that pretty much describes it. Um, uh, and I know that, you know, my, my advisors, my legal advisor, my CPA have advised over the years that, um, a lot of, a lot of, uh, how it might be looked at is how, how do you direct their day of that person you're working with? Uh, so uh, you have to take that into account a little bit, but here's the other thing. And this is based upon an experience I had, and I'm, I'm not going to play lawyer here, but I'm going to tell you about an experience <laughs> that I had when I had, a, when I yeah. had another business in the past uh, where I was using a combination of employees and I had consortium partners um, uh-huh. in the state of Illinois, at least at that time, they were, they were uh, very aggressive about looking for places where people, we're not, we're organizations, we're not paying the unemployment uh, stuff. The only, so the only department of employment security came in and examined the people I was working with. And the lesson I learned is that there was no question my employees that are my employees and we were doing withholding and we're paying the uh, unemployment insurance for those people. But the state mm-hmm. insisted that I had these commission partners that um, were also considered employees. And we, we challenged it. My lawyer and I challenged it and we took it Mm-hmm. all the way to an administrative law judge. We ultimately lost mm-hmm. because the AL, you know, the administrative law judge, it's like a pack court. They, they never, they never rule in favor. Mm. Of At least that's been my oh, experience, wow. but here's the lesson learned. Mm-hmm. Um, a number mm-hmm. of those people that I was, u- I was I was using at the time, they were sole proprietors and, or yes. they, were, they were doing their business under their social security number. So what yes. I would advise a small business or a business out there, if you're going to embrace this kind of business model and you're going to use virtual assistants, make sure that they are established as a business. They have an mm-hmm. FEIN number, not a social security number, and that you're, you're billing them uh, or they're billing you as a, uh, as a, as a business. Because uh, I, I, I got to imagine other states may be the same as Illinois. You might get cross. Oh, yeah. Other states department. can be much pickier even than yeah. Illinois, quite honestly, these yeah. days. So, yeah. And as a matter of fact, that's one of the things that I teach in my program is, you know, while it's not the virtual assistants or what I call um, the people I train are virtual experts, it's not their job to make sure that the person person that hires them is making sure that they uh, go with what the 1099 rulings are. But Mm -hmm. if you want to be a really good consortium partner for someone like you, you're going to know that and, and be, you know, uh, cognizant of that and make sure that relationship remains in that way. And if, um, you know, because you, just like you said, it's a partnership, your business to business working. Um, with that uh, consortium partner, as you call them, which I love that title, um, yeah. not an employee. And you have to be really clear on that. Oh, yeah. um, another yeah. thing that I always do, and m- I'm sure you have processes or a lot more processes in place than I do, but when I decide to hire somebody new before we even begin working together, I make sure I have their W-9 um, mm-hmm. in place and, you know, that they, they are a business and all of those types of things because I don't want to be surprised later on. Yep. You have to set those expectations up front and, uh, and, uh, you know, and also, and I, I shouldn't make it sound like I'm trying to skirt unemployment security laws. That's no. You, hey, you know what? I was thinking when you said that, Mark, I thought I just paid my unemployment for myself. They're not missing out on anything. Yeah, no, they, <laughs> I they, paid they, a lot of unemployment. <laughs> yeah, they, they get they get paid. Uh, and I, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that people cheat the system. But if you've no. got somebody mm-hmm. that, that is an outsource resource that is a supplier to you, and you, and right. you view them as suppliers, and you're not controlling mm-hmm. their day on a 40 hour a week right. basis, like a typical employer, if you're doing things and can, and most of those partners that come in, all of them, as a matter of fact, they're coming in and, and you mm-hmm. know, what, what I'm not controlling their day other than that, mm-hmm. they're going to give me work over a certain amount of hours. And very rarely, if ever, mm-hmm. does anybody put in 35, 40 hours a week on a project for me. Right. So, uh, so I want to make, I want to yeah. make sure in case the government's listening and I'm not trying to cheat you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> me neither. Yeah. Me neither. <laughs> yes, yes. No, in fact, what you're talking about, Mark, is actually um, exactly what the IRS wants us to do, right? And mm-hmm. so that's really good advice for everyone. And thank you for sharing that. 
Um, and by the way, because of the industry that I'm in and because I train people on this, I do really stay on top of those issues. I try to stay on top of them yeah. U.S. wide because they do vary by state. Yes. Um, so while I'm not a lawyer either, I, I thank you goodness because I could never figure out how to be a lawyer. It makes my head spin. Um, mm -hmm. I do read up on that and try to stay up on any new legislation that comes through. Um, and the good news is, um, in my opinion, well, it's good news in my opinion, let me say it that way. Um, the world is, and the U.S. is going more and more to the remote virtual team yeah. Yeah. Um, like you have. What do you think about that? Do you see it headed that direction also? Oh, I agree. Yeah, I, uh, uh, I, I don't think uh, organizations are going to entirely come back to having as many people coming into an office every day as they used to. Uh, in fact, I've had some conversations with people in commercial real estate and they say that, uh, uh, yeah, that the traditional office in, the, in a big downtown area like Chicago, that's going to bring in hundreds of people a day, at least for the, the time, the time being for the future, that's not going to be the case. And even, and even if we assume that um, COVID is going to go away completely and knock on wood, it will eventually, we'll get it under control. I think it's going to have altered the way in which businesses operate and the behavior of people. And there are, there are, there are advantages even to an employer to have your people working remotely. Um, think, think about this for a second. Um, it, it, what, in fact, one of the things that can cause performance issues for people in an organization and for the organization is the, is, is stress. In fact, stress causes 1 million lost work days every year in America because people are stressed on the job. And, and think about one wow. of the things that causes stress before you ever get to work. Especially if you live in a large metropolitan area like Chicago. Traffic. It's the traffic and the commute. Whether you're in a yeah. car or in the train or anything else, there's stress mm -hmm. involved in that. And so yes. people arrive at work, they're stressed. And the, the water cooler talk for the first half hour around the water cooler for a lot of people is, oh, you wouldn't believe the traffic today in the Kennedy. Or the Eisenhower was yet again, a, you know, an absolute mess. And, and uh, so th those things in, a, in no small way have an impact on productivity and mindset. And again, stress, stress is a huge uh, drain on productivity in organizations. So think about how you eliminate at least that element of stress by allowing people to work virtual. Now, there are trade-offs. You have to make sure that um, people are remaining engaged and, and you have to help them manage and organize their, their work from wherever they're working. Typically, it's going to be probably at home. Help them, and, uh, help them to understand that you know, you've got a job to do, but also give them, give them the, the benefit of the doubt that there may be distractions during the day that they have to attend to. You know, they're, they're in the middle of something and somebody's at the front door or the kids come home early from school because one of them's sick. Um, as an employer, you're going to have to you're going to have to be prepared for those kinds of situations, and understand that um, those things are going to happen because they can happen to any one of us. So you have to you have to work you have to work through and understand you need to support your employees and give them the benefit of the doubt. Clearly, if somebody's taking advantage of it, you have to deal with that. That's an HR issue. But for the most part, as a, as an enlightened leader or, or, or business manager, you need to you need to understand that those things are going to happen in the world with a virtual workforce or a workforce that's more virtual. Uh, so I think those things are all going to be part and parcel going forward. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm a uh, long winded answer. Um, this is going to, this is going to, no, that was, ex <laughs> that was exactly what I wanted to know. <laughs> so you've talked um, a little bit about the benefits of having a remote or virtual team, whether employees or independent contractors. Um, yeah. Any other benefits that you haven't mentioned already or any negatives, any cons on having well, a remote virtual team? Yeah, no, it's a great question. The, the benefits, the, the big benefits are, as I, as I say, um, I eliminate, I'm able to eliminate overhead. I can precisely match what a customer needs, no more, no less. Uh, it makes it a little easier for me to manage my day. I don't have to worry about managing employees and the employee issues per se, because those people, when when I when I'm not working with them or they, I need to bring them in. They got their own deal and they're doing their own thing, and they're off in their own world. Um, the other advantage is uh, it, it it again it simplifies how I operate the business. I guess a down a, a downside, which is always manageable, is you're not you're not face to face with people as, as if we were all in an office as employees. 
But um, I think that that's become less and less of an issue because of technology like we're using now to have this right. podcast. Um, uh, boy, I wish I would have had stock in Zoom a long time ago. Oh, um, do, I know me too. <laughs> I was like, why didn't I buy that? <laughs> yeah. So, and it's not, it, it could, be, could be Skype. It could be just a con- teleconference. It, all, all sorts of capabilities. Being able to collaborate, um, you know, with uh, various softwares and applications like Google Sheets and all those kinds of things. Those are all productivity enhancers that make it easier to work uh, remotely and virtually. So the downsides, there are some challenges to it, but they don't, um, they're not ones that bother me. And in as much as I was already working virtually before all the stuff that we're, incur- we're encountering now happened, there was little and no adjustment for me because of what's happening. Yeah, and I, and I feel very fortunate to have the same situation. Um, and one of the things that I think, and well, let me ask you instead of me posing this. Okay. Um, what do you think was holding people back, holding businesses back from going a little bit, at least an option of more remote work for employee? employees or independent contractors and how might that have shifted now that they were forced into it? Uh, great question. I think that there are, it's a two part answer or there are two elements to the answer. One is uh, just uh, uh, the, the existing paradigm, the way business has always been done. And I think the other, mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. the other motivating force for why it wasn't encouraged uh more in the past is a sense of control on the part of the employer. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm concerned about my people not being as productive if I let them work from home. Now, enlightened, enlightened leaders and business owners, they don't get stuck in that, that, that part of mm-hmm. the equation. Right. But I think, I think those are my sense is that those are the two factors. It's, it's paradigm. It's the way yeah. we've always done it. And, mm-hmm. or um, a, a sense of, a sense or need to have a sense of control over your people. Yeah. I read uh, somewhere that a lot of managers who, and I like that word enlightened, who who haven't got, who haven't seen the light yet, (laughs) um, they were concerned um, because they couldn't see their employees anymore. And if they couldn't see them, uh, see them actually at their desk working, they, like you said, they didn't have that sense of control that they were actually working. Yeah, yeah. Now there there is software that exists out there that allows an employer to actually, for those who are you know heavily relying on a laptop or a computer, there is technology mm-hmm. that allows an employer to peek in and see you know are you are you keystroking, and mm-hmm. have you not done anything with your computer for a matter of minutes? So there's that right. big brother stuff. I call it big brother stuff, and I I, right. I can see where there's there's an application for it in some places particularly if, if you're a highly regulated industry where you need to make sure there's compliance uh, yes. or um, there, there's, there's a, a production demand that requires things to happen in, in real time to support that. Mm-hmm. I can see that, but if it's not necessary, um, don't be big brother would be my. Yeah, exactly. That, yeah. that adds stress, unneeded stress. It sure you does. talk about stress. Yes. You know, I've heard a lot of people t- t- share with me that that is the situation and most of them ended up quitting those jobs where they oversaw them at, to that extent. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So do you have any other tips? You've shared a few already. I really appreciate it. Do you have any other tips yeah. on how to manage a remote virtual team? Yeah, I would, I would say, uh, I, well, a couple of them I've already touched on. One is uh, you, you've, hired, you've hired employees to work in your organization. You're trusting the assets and the reputation and the brand to those people. Give them the room and the space. Assuming you've trained them properly and you've selected them properly, give them the space and give them the sense of responsibility that they're going to do the job for you as opposed to micromanaging them. So that would be probably my first and foremost tip. Clearly, if you have someone that's taking advantage, and it'll show up eventually, you'll be able to tell. You need to deal with that and, and do those all those things that you know uh, good HR best practices would tell you you need to do it also from a, a legal and technical standpoint. But for the most part, if you're going to entrust your, organ- your, your organization and its reputation to your employees, then do so. Let them do their job and, and give them support and help them. And understand that there may be distractions because working virtually, working virtually is going to be different than being in an office. Uh, so, so be of help and support as opposed to being big brother 
if you had to choose between the two, err on the side of being supportive and coaching your people rather than merely managing them. And there's a difference between coaching people in a work environment and managing. Um, and, and in fact, in many organizations, managers, 90% of managers that are put into a position to be a local supervisor or manager have no formal training whatsoever in how to coach, how to coach people. Um, they know how to manage, but they don't know how to coach. And you bring the best out in people when you provide an environment where you coach them and give them, give them the opportunity to let their strengths come, sh come through and do what they do best and help them, help them along. And if here's another tip I would, I would, I would offer, and this, this is true for people that are working in an office and as well as virtually when we fail, when we make a mistake, we make it quickly we learn from them and we move on just as quickly. We don't dwell on it. We don't look for someone to blame. We don't look for the, we don't look to punish someone. Um, and that's, that's part of that abundance mindset, you know, mm -hmm. pivot and move away from that kind of a mindset. Mm -hmm. Let's fail quickly. Let's learn from it and move on just as quickly. That may be my mm -hmm. best, my, my, my best tip I can offer right now. <laughs> that's a great tip. It is. And it's also something that I really live by. Um, that is what I train the virtual experts in my program. Yeah. Exactly that. I, tr I try to drill it into their heads over and over and over again. Yeah. And it is what I want um, anybody on my team to do. Uh, admit. It, it, and here's what, it, here's what I actually teach. I say, okay, so you're working for a client. Let's say I was working for you, Mark. Mm -hmm. And a mistake occurred. And I really felt... Like it was a result of something you did or did not do. Mm -hmm. I, I teach uh, that I should not say to you, hey, Mark, this is not my fault. This is yours. You did X, Y, Z. Instead, I should say, wow, I'm really sorry that happened. Here's my recommendation on how to prevent it in the future. Yep. And my recommendation on how to fix it right now. Are you in agreement? Yeah, now that's, you, you touched on something. If you think about some of the best coaches in the world, when they do a leadership coaching, they focus mm -hmm. on, they, they focus with their, with their clients on, think about conversing and having dialogue and asking questions that are uh, how and what questions. How can, mm -hmm. how can we do this differently in the future? Or what can we do differently in the future? Or what, mm -hmm. what, what could I have done to help you to avoid this from happening? Again, yeah, uh, move away from looking to punish someone. We're, right. The other thing to understand too, as a leader and as a manager, we're, we all don't live in the Vatican. We're all fallible. We all make mistakes. <laughs> we're not perfect. <laughs> I'm, I'm not, I, but I, I have I, a I'm, tiara and I'm a I, princess. I know you have your tiara, <laughs> you have your tiara and that gives you some protection, but no, you're not infallible. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to, I'm sorry to ruin your day. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're, we're all fallible. We all, we all make mistakes and we will make mistakes. Um, but here's, That's here's exactly the interesting right. thing about it. And, and this is, this is back to that abundance mindset concept again. Mm -hmm. um, I've worked with a lot of organizations and I've been around the, the survey research world as well. And what I've found, even with large organizations where it's a complex product that the customer's buying and the customer's investing millions of dollars in, in that product or service, I've seen mm -hmm. research that shows that customer satisfaction is actually higher when they're, when something goes wrong with the product or the service and it, and, and that then provides an opportunity for the manufacturer or for the, for the, the, the supplier to actually fix mm -hmm. the problem. When, when, when you're given that opportunity and you can fix the problem, your satisfaction uh, uh, scores with your customers is sometimes even is often higher than if the customer has a perfect experience and nothing ever goes wrong. Ironically mm -hmm. enough, and what, what that suggests to me is that everybody understands conceptually that mistakes are going to happen. None of us are perfect. And at the end of the day, I know as a customer, I'm going to be taken care of even when stuff goes wrong. And so the abundance mindset would say, Oh, we're going to panic. Oh, something went wrong. We have to, we have to look for someone to blame. We're going to throw Joe under the bus because this is, this is our biggest customer and they're spending millions of dollars and we can't afford to lose this customer. So we're going to sacrifice somebody for that wrong thing. Mm -hmm. to do. Own it, mm -hmm. learn from it. It provides an opportunity to, to, to make it right. And when things really go wrong, 
the best thing you can do is just figure out how to be part of the solution. How to be part of the fix. Oh, that's all you I can do. That. Yeah. Yeah, I love that so much. So we're going to get ready to wrap up here. Okay. So I have two more things I want to ask you. One, sure. is there anything else that I haven't asked you that you want to share on any of these topics we talked about or anything we didn't even talk about, but you feel like would be important for our listeners? Yeah. Um, one, thing I, one thing I would say to add to everything I've mentioned so far is that uh, th there's a lot of discussion right now about what's going to happen with the world going forward and, and how are things going to be different, the, the new normal, so to speak, which I'm getting tired of hearing, to be candid. <laughs> um, normal, normal is what it, what it is at the time. What, what, I would, what I've been telling my clients and what I tell prospects is that there just happens to be a time right now to do something you should always be doing with your business anyway. It shouldn't take a crisis for you to go back and what I, what I say, understand and go back to the basics of your business. Uh, and there's actually, there's actually a quote, um, in fact, I have it on my screen, but I'm just going to read it off to you. It's a quote that I've been quoting, and I, I came across this. It's actually a quote from Albert Einstein, his uh, three rules of work in terms of going back to the basics. And his three rules, rules of work are this, out of clutter, find simplicity, from discord, find harmony, and in the middle of difficulty lies opportunity. It doesn't, it, it, it doesn't necessarily take a crisis uh, to, to uh, always be looking at your business and find places where you can get rid of clutter. Back to what I said at the top of our conversation, look at your processes to see where are those activities that you're doing and your people are being forced to do that then no, do nothing to the final outcome and get back to you know, getting stuff that maybe have kind of gunked up the works and, and simplify things. Find mm -hmm. where there's discord that has grown into the organization because of politics or silos or competing interests and, and get back to a sense of harmony. And then always, always be looking for opportunity because they always exist, whether there's a crisis or not. So uh, th that would be my recommendation. And you, don't need, you don't need COVID or a, a, a worldwide pandemic to do that. You should always be looking at your business and think about those three three principles or three worlds of work. So that would be my, my parting uh, comment today on that. Uh, thank you. I love that. And I love Albert Einstein. His hair is much like mine. I kind of <laughs> model my hair after his. <laughs> well, you look, you look better than Tiara than he would have. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Mark, uh, I don't know. I'm sure that others listening in are just like me going, oh my gosh, this guy is a <laughs> fountain of wealth plus fun. Uh, so how can people get a hold of you if they're interested in finding out if working with you uh, in your company, if hiring your company would be a good fit for them, something they need? Yeah. A uh, couple of couple ways to contact me. Uh, my email address is Mark J. So my first name, last initial Mark J at perform advisors. So P E R F O R M A D V I S O R S.com. My number uh, is 630-882-9107. Also uh, welcome to welcome people to connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm on LinkedIn at perform advisors. Uh, so you can find me there or just, you know, uh, search my name, Mark James. Uh, there are a lot of Mark James in the world, but you'll find the Mark James that's related to perform advisors would be the place to uh, find me there. So any and all those are a way to go. Uh, and I would encourage anybody who wants to even just ask a question. Um, and, and another thing I should point out is that my philosophy for the most part for this year, especially because of what's going on is not so much focusing on, uh, you know, a commercial transaction right now as, just trying to be of help to people and being of service. And that's part of that abundance mentality, give to receive. And uh, the, the, commercial, the commercial return will come to me or anybody else who practices uh, being of service to people and being of help. So if you got a question, don't hesitate to call me or contact me. I'm not going to turn the meter on and charge you. Happy to do some pro <laughs> promoter work. So Chris, it's, it's Christmas in July. <laughs> Yeah, and we are literally recording this July 16th, 2020. Yeah. So he, he nailed that one. That was good. <laughs> so Mark, um, if somebody's listening to this, because I know I have been like this myself, um, thinking, oh my gosh, this guy sounds so amazing. I doubt that I my business might not be a good fit for um, somebody that he would be mm. willing to work with. Can you tell us a little bit about your ideal client and, and who those 
people are that might be a sure. really good fit for you. Yeah, happy to do that. Uh, pri my, my primary focus is in the B2B world. So B2B manufacturers or provider of a service. Uh, and and uh, size-wise, uh, it, it, it kind of it kind of is a wide range. Um, the, the typical range is five to ten million in annual revenue up to a billion. But there are always exceptions because uh, there there are startup organizations that can use my help uh, just as easily. So don't be so con so concerned about number of employees uh, or uh, the revenue size. Other than being in the being in the B two B space uh, and having some sort of uh, critical mass as far as the business. Um, I probably am not a good fit, for instance, for a lo local bait and tackle shop uh, or a, a hair salon, uh, just to be transparent about it. Yeah, so no, you, that's exactly what I wanted to know. Okay. So good. thank you. And I love that yeah. you're that specific. I, I want those numbers. I want that specificity. Um, and many people aren't willing to give it. So thank you for doing that. I yeah, really happy, appreciate it. Happy to do it. And, and there's one more thing I want to point out um, that you are the first uh, to do. And it's probably not surprising that you're the first um, to do this on my podcast since you are the MDO, the first male. <laughs> um, you are also the first person to use a sports metaphor. And I'm assuming that I'm saying that correctly, that that uh, the bench, the deep bench. Oh, yeah. Is a sports metaphor. <laughs> Can yes. you tell I'm not even sure what a sports metaphor is? <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's a sports metaphor. Also, the, uh, the <laughs> you, you, you pass the test. You understand sports. <laughs> if you understand bench strength, you got it. You got it. That was it. I'm like, yeah, I is. think that's sports. <laughs> yeah. It, also, the uh, the comment I made about fail quickly and move on and learn from it. Yeah, that actually yeah. is from a, a, a football coach uh, for a Big Ten school several years ago. He made. I did not know that. Talking about working with his team, he that. said, "We fail quickly and we move on." So I did know. not know where that came from, and yeah. I have used that quote a lot. So, yeah, so yeah, I, I can't take credit for it, but I'm happy to pass it on. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, so, um, and you know, it's so funny, Mark, because I've. Uh, I had a, a male coach, a business coach. It was actually a sales coach that I worked with for a while. And he kept using sports metaphors and I didn't understand them. I really uh, didn't. And I kept uh, having to ask him to explain them to me. And he's like, all right, I'm gonna have to come up with metaphors that work for you. What do women use for metaphors? And I'm like, we like food, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, celebrities, yeah. Uh, tiaras and makeup and glamour and he's like oh yeah I'm not gonna ever be able to come up with any of those <laughs> <laughs> well I, I'm glad you mentioned that because that that's a, a word to me as a piece of advice I should make sure that I, I don't get too far afield with uh, <laughs> uh, uh, analogies they may not fit for the ultimate audience yeah yeah so, yeah uh, no you did not and I, I actually love that um, phrase that you were using and I just wanted to tease you a little bit um, <laughs> <Okay>. because <laughs> because I really really value you being um, our first male podcast guest so thank you so much Mark for being well, again here. I I'm honored I'm honored and I appreciate the opportunity and I really enjoyed the conversation and uh, 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 always of always willing to be of help if you ever need it Thank you so much. And by the way, all of the links that he talked about today will be on the show notes. So you can go there and click that and look for his contact information there also. Thank you for listening to Dare to Leap. Say hello and access additional resources at virtualexperttraining.com. There you'll be able to connect with Kathy to share your feedback and join her community. Join us again soon on Dare to Leap. Until then. Mm -hmm.